Welcome to Accreditation Conversations. I'm your host, Amy Dykins from Weave, and today I'll be speaking with Herman Bounds from the U.S. Department of Education. Herman is the director of the accreditation group within the Office of Post-Secondary Education. He assumed that position in February of 2014 after spending two years as an education program specialist in the accreditation group. Herman was the Deputy Director at the Aviation Career Campus of Metro Technology Centers, a career and technical education school district in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. While serving as the Deputy Director, Herman played a major role with developing a first-of-its-kind workforce development project, which provided Tinker Air Force Base with approximately 1,500 credentialed aviation maintenance technicians. During his tenure as Deputy Director of the Aviation Career Campus, they maintained a 90% graduation and placement rate average for the Aviation Maintenance Technology Program. Wow. Herman was active in the accreditation process at the state level and served on site visit teams for the State Department of Career and Technical Education. Herman was also a subject matter expert for a human factor study, psychological study of aircraft accidents conducted by the Federal Aviation Administration. In addition, Herman is a U.S. Army veteran with 20 years of service. Herman has a master's degree in aerospace administration from Southeastern Oklahoma State University and an educational specialist in education administration leadership from Walden University. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Herman about the process of accreditor recognition through the Department of Education uh, that he and his team lead for us. Uh, Let's get started. Good morning, Herman. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Uh, I would really like to uh, kind of begin by asking you to introduce um, your role at the Department of Education and um, really uh, in the larger higher education landscape, if you could talk uh, and give our listeners an idea of um, what role you play in that context um, as we begin our conversation. Well, sure, and, and and again, I would like to say uh, thanks for thanks for having me. This this is a uh, this is a, a new opportunity. So uh, again, I just want to say happy to be here. Yeah. So you know, I am uh, the director of the accreditation group. You know, at the uh, U.S. Department of Education, um, and so I'm really involved in the federal role. You know, there's a what we call an educational triad where we have the federal government, we have uh, <clears throat> the states, and then we have the accrediting agency. So in my federal role, the accreditation group really carries out, well, we have a number of responsibilities, but uh, one of the main ones is we carry out the secretary's recognition process of accrediting agencies. So we have oversight of of the recognized accrediting agency. So there are, there are basically uh, 53 total. Um, I think I got that number right. Uh, 37 of them are basically uh, institutional accrediting agencies, which would include some that accredit like freestanding institutions. An example would be the American Bar Association. They may accredit a freestanding law school that's independent of a, of a university. Uh, and then I think there are like 16 purely programmatic accrediting agencies that uh, accredit only educational programs within institutions of higher education. And then we also have oversight of five state approval agencies for vocational uh, education, excuse me, four state approval agencies for vocational education, and they are credit for Title IV purposes. And then we also have five state approval agencies for nursing education, which are basically your state boards of nursing. So I think total, that's what, 62 uh, accrediting organ. I think my math is right, accrediting organizations uh, that we have direct oversight and uh uh, the state agencies come in for review every four years and the accrediting agencies come in for review every five years. Uh, we also, you know, of course, investigate complaints against those, uh, you know, those recognized accrediting organizations. Uh, and so that's all really part of the recognition process. Now, that's the accrediting agency part of what we do at the department. We also uh, review the medical education standards of foreign countries for their medical education. Uh, and we work with a committee. It's the uh, National Committee on Foreign Medical Education and Accreditation. And so uh, I think we have 20, 20 or 21 countries that we have determined to have comparable medical education standards. 
And that allows uh, any U.S. students that would attend <clears throat> some of those foreign medical schools, they can participate in federal student aid. Uh, and, uh, and so we review those kinds. They're reviewed for uh, uh, comparability, for comparability determination, like every, you know, every six years. Uh, uh, and those also coincide with the reviews of accrediting agencies. One of our other, couple of our other functions that we do uh, is related to, uh, we also approve military degree granting uh, institutions. Uh, so anytime a military institution wants to add a new uh, degree program, uh, we have to review that degree program uh, and determine whether it, it would meet us the standard of being a uh, on the level of a uh, of a degree that could be offered at an institution of higher education. So uh, we kind of perform that function and approve the degree program along with a recognized accrediting agency also then has to accredit that particular program. So people like, you know, the Defense Intelligence University, uh, any of the uh, uh, some of the military academies, if they want to if they want to add additional degrees, that that's a new requirement that we have just got it. We used to only review graduate degree degrees at the at the graduate level, excuse me. Uh, uh, but now we have some other guidance from DOD where we need to look at uh, degree programs below the below the graduate level. So that that can be some interesting uh, reviews. And then we also have within the accreditation group a state liaison team, which works with some state uh, authorizers and state authorities uh, uh, related to accreditation issues, school closures, and and, and those types. So I know I just said a lot, but yeah, that's, yeah, and that's, you're a busy guy, right? <laughs> yeah, that's so, really what we really what we do. Yeah, and the reviews of accrediting agencies are huge. I mean, some of those petitions for recognitions are there. There, there can be up to you know thirty or forty thousand pages of documentation, oh and our guys have to kind of mull through that and determine whether they are compliant with our regulations, and then they have to submit documentation to demonstrate the application of whatever policy we have and whatever policy they have. So it's it's a lot of work for 10 folks. Yeah, that is a lot of work. You also raised something that I think is um, kind of a nuance of the work you do uh, that I've been discovering as I have some of these conversations with folks. And that is that um, both um, an institutional accreditor may um, be a, a programmatic accreditor in a different case. Yes. Um, uh, and so I wondered if you could say a little bit more about that, because I was like, oh, I hadn't really thought about it from that perspective before. And can you also say a little bit about um, maybe the differences in if you're approving that accreditation organization to do but one or both? Um, I think that would be interesting for folks to hear. Yeah. So, again, we have uh, an out of the out of the 37 institutions, I don't have a breakdown of which ones also accredit. Uh, uh, programs. The unfortunate thing for those types of agencies is that, uh, again, I use the American Bar Association as an example. There is also the Commission on uh, Massage Therapy. So there are a couple of others. I don't want to just, you know, pick on the ABA, but those those types of agencies, we actually review them based on our institutional requirements, which would include any of the basic requirements for programs. Um, so for agencies that only accredit educational programs, they, they, they have a specific set of criteria that they must meet. And, and it's really absent anything to do with, uh, you know, with uh, Title IV responsibilities, you know, how they manage and administer Title IV funds. There are some requirements for uh, institutional credit agencies that we call under our substantive change regulations. You know, if they want to make a change in degree level or delivery of a program, uh, other things related to additional locations and branch campuses, there, there, that's just a few of those things that the institutional folks have to worry about versus the programmatic folks don't. The other thing, though, that those agencies that accredit both uh, when it comes to their the bodies that make their accreditation decisions, we call them their decision making bodies, whether they're commissions or councils. Um, when it comes to those bodies or their site teams, the folks that accredit both institutions and programs, they have to have some additional members on their site teams. 
So the institutional accrediting agencies have to have what we call educators, excuse me, they have to have academics and administrators on their site team as a requirement. But the programmatic guys, uh, purely programmatic folks have to have what we call educators and practitioners. So if you if you accredit both institutions and programs, you have to have a mix of four of those entities. And in some cases, employers based on the new regulations. So the site teams have to include, you know, more people depending on, uh, you know, the type of accreditation that's being performed at the time of the review or for a specific you know, situation, if I explain that well enough. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And you also raised uh, another uh, kind of interesting um, thing that's emerging in these programmatic accreditors uh, need to uh, really engage not just in the discipline in uh, the academy, but also uh, starting to bridge that um, what has been seen maybe as a gap um, over into uh, the employers. So the folks that hire your graduates being involved intentionally in the accreditation process. Uh, can you say just a little bit more about that? Are you seeing that um, start to uh, really take hold and, and seeing some positives from that kind of uh, switch in thinking? Yeah, we, you know, uh, the, the upcoming uh, the Seeky meeting, those agencies that are up for review at that particular meeting, uh, you know, have been reviewed under the new regulatory changes. Uh so we haven't seen a lot yet of involvement of employers on those particular uh, uh, bodies, uh, but I know there's there's discussion about how to how to include those because the regulations do now do now say you know you have to have these practitioners and or employers. So there's a there's a choice implied there, uh, but I think we expect probably to see some more. Uh, you know, some more employer in, involvement uh, in those in those groups. And we'll have to wait and see how it, you know, how it plays out. Because sometimes you have to look at employers. They may have a different, they, they may bring a different perspective into the review process versus, you know, maybe what a practitioner uh, would would bring into the effects. So I think it, it's probably uh, probably going to play out to be beneficial. Excellent. Well, we will uh, we'll follow up in the future and see uh, what you're seeing as that continues to be a part of the process. Uh, you just raised um, another uh, one of our acronyms. Man, we love all of our, our letters in uh, the Academy, uh, NISIKI. And so the National Advisory Committee on Institutional Quality and Integrity. Um, yeah. I have heard it for uh, years, uh, Nisiki, and you kind of get like a general kind of feeling of what they do. But I would love for you to spend just a little bit of time um, talking to our listeners and, and help them understand um, more about Nisiki and, um, you know, the makeup of the committee, the role of the committee. Um, I think that would be extremely helpful. Yeah. So the um, the. Uh... You know, committee. I think they're made up of uh, 18 members, uh, and and the Nasiki. Uh, uh, you know, they they are there to also make a recommendation to a person in the department that we call the senior department official when it comes to recognition uh, decisions. You know, department staff. We make a recommendation, and then the Nasiki makes a recommendation. A lot of people don't understand that that both of those recognition, both of those recognition recommendations will then go to this senior department official and they will actually make the final decision on whether to recognize an accrediting agency or not. So that's just kind of a general, you know, scope and purpose of, of, of how that system works. Uh, again, they are made up of 18 members. I think they are appointed equally, uh, you know, uh, uh, in Congress, I think, uh, the uh, the Senate uh, pro tem uh, appoints uh, a number again, and then of course in the House there is a number uh, of folks appointed uh, there, and uh, the Secretary though I think has six appointees, so that can that can change the political makeup of the committee, you know, based on uh, the administration at that particular time, but. Other than the the six that the secretary appoints, all other uh, all of the other positions are they're appointed in equal numbers uh, 
you know, either Democratic or Republican. Excellent. Uh, and so the, the overall committee is um, made up of um, these representatives that um, may have different leanings depending on the current administration, it sounds like. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that, that's, really, that's really true. I mean, every, all of the committee members will bring some sort of uh, history with them to the, you know, to the committee. But, you know, I think all in all, uh, uh, they, they are all really trying to, to make uh, uh, our educational systems better. And they're trying to, uh, you know, they're trying to make sure that accrediting agencies are, are conducting proper oversight uh, of their, uh, you know, of their institutions. And there are times when our recommendations do vary. You know, my staff really has, we, we really stick closely to what the regulations require. Uh, the Nasiki members can have discussions and they may interpret things differently. So that's sometimes where you might get a difference in, uh, a difference in interpretation of, of a regulation or a difference in interpretation of, of, uh, of you know, particular processes that accrediting agencies may use. And that then leads to maybe a difference in the recommendations that that we would submit to the senior department official versus what Nasiki would would uh, submit to the senior department official. Excellent. So uh, maybe a little more uh, black and white for you. the the regulation and is there a preponderance of evidence that the standard is met? Kind of thinking. Yes versus some of the more uh, discussion and uh, maybe what you might think of as a qualitative kind of, you know, coming from my experience, this is how yes. I feel about this. Yeah. Very interesting. Yes. Yes. And that causes, and, and if you've ever attended an Nasiki meeting, you may see some of those, some of those interactions. And we have had some pretty, I'll use the term lively, <laughs> passionate meetings, <Yeah. laughs> you know, between staff and Nasiki members. And, and it's really, um, I guess we're really, really trying to get to the place where uh, we can try to determine if an accrediting agency, number one, is in compliance with with our regulations uh, and if they are also uh, implementing our regulations properly and if they are also following their own policies and procedures and if they act reasonably, reasonably when one of their institutions may be in, in some sort of trouble or you know, do they take proper adverse action or proper action in, in general, uh, you know, with their, you know, with their institutions? Excellent. So um, one of the things that I uh, had wanted to ask you as a part of our call today was around um, ensuring equitable practices. Um, you know, we talk about that a lot between um, institutions who are accredited by the same accreditor, whether it's uh, programmatic or institutional. You know, how do you ensure that um, it's a fair process of um, going through this evaluation and making a recommendation? Uh, can you talk about that a little bit um, from your perspective for us? Yeah, I can. And that's really, that's really a good question. And that's really uh, a big concern for my group. Uh, you know, one of the things that we do is, uh, you know, the analysts do work independently, the staff analysts on my staff, they do work independently when they're conducting their reviews. Uh, they're, they're all very, very smart people. Uh, uh, and um, once they complete those reviews, you know, I have to review everything. And so I'm trying to ensure that that the reviews and their recommendations are consistent. Uh, and that's kind of one way that we tackle it. The other way is we have these weekly weekly staff meetings and then we dis discuss among each other, uh, you know, particular situations that that they may have encountered uh, in their review of a uh you know, of an accrediting organization. And we, we really kind of discuss those things to make sure that whatever final analysis we come out with, we've applied our, our rules consistently with all of the accrediting agencies that we have reviewed. And then I think our third piece of that, we really involve uh, our program attorneys from our Office of General Counsel. So when we, when there are, when there are areas of gray, uh, uh, and if there are, you know, we think there's going to be some sort of uh, legal risk for the department, uh, we really, uh, uh, 
pull those folks into the discussion and try to come up with a, a recommendation, number one, that's that's uh, in accordance with our regulations. And then uh, based on our uh, our counsel from our attorneys, you know, that's legally supportable. So uh, we, we do put a lot of work into trying to make sure that everybody's treated fairly. Uh, the one thing, too, that I tell people, though, you know, credit agencies are all different. I mean, they are. And some of those decisions, you know, are kind of based on how maybe a particular accrediting agency operates. You know, when, you, when you're trying to determine, do they have the right personnel? You know, well, how many schools do they accredit? You know, uh, uh, you know, you know, what's the size of their staff? All those, all that goes into uh, determining whether one agency may be compliant with a particular uh, uh, regulatory requirement or not. So, it's 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 nuanced. They're all different, um, uh, especially when you're looking at institutional versus programmatic. Uh, but we still really try to be as consistent as we can, uh, especially when we're going to find an agency non-compliant with the regulations. Yeah, that is a really great point. We talk um, extensively about the differences between um, different institutions and their missions. And so applying that thinking here, um, you know, it makes a lot of sense, right? You know, if you're a one man band and you're trying to uh, accredit, you know, a thousand institutions, may not be properly staffed versus, you know, somebody else who has one full-time staffer that it may be completely appropriate. It really depends. And, and I know we don't like, we want, you know, black and white, hard facts kind of things sometimes. And um, in this type of work, the evaluation, um, not just in higher education, but uh, I've done some research in, um, in nonprofit in general, you know, it, it takes um, a lot of folks doing really hard work um, to make um, hard judgments sometimes, just like in law. And so that's very interesting to hear that you're also pulling in these other resources as you're making um, what can be uh, a difficult decision. Um, but like you said, in my experience, all of these folks that are involved um, at your level, at the federal level, um, the folks who are involved in the accreditation organizations, um, their accredited members, I, you know, I interact with folks who care deeply and tremendously about higher education, about the students, their families. Uh, you know, that's why um, you and others, in my experience, do this work, right? Because you want the United States to have this amazing higher education system that provides access and opportunity to students, not something that makes all of us in this space very sad um, when we see um, students not achieving um, what they dreamed of when they were thinking about a higher education experience. Um, and so I, I think you're surfacing some of that um, for us as you talk about, you know, being fair and equitable, but it also depends, you know, and you, you have to draw on wisdom that you have for many years of experience and um, from training and in other different areas in order to make a judgment that's fair and reasonable going forward, uh, Harmon. So thank you for that and for the work that you guys are all doing there um, at the department. Um, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit. And I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about, you know, you are in a unique position, um, kind of like um, our friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Jackson Hammond over at TIA, where you're seeing inside of many accreditation organizations. And um, I asked you to think about that for a little bit uh, and provide back to our listeners because we have um, many accreditation uh, organizations that also listen to the podcast. Um, some things that you can take away that are about um, best practices that you see in accreditation organizations, those folks who are um, doing great work and are being successful in their recognitions. Um, what kind of things do you see? What kind of um, things do you look for uh, in an excellent accreditation organization? Well, you know, I think, and again, that's that's really a good question. Again, there are, you know, uh, uh, what did I say for 62 of those folks that are those organizations that are out there and they're all, you know, they're, they're all different. Uh, but I think the really successful ones 
they really have good monitoring practices, meaning they, they have systems in place uh, to monitor their institutions uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, that one, they're compliant with agency standards and, and, uh, and to make sure that, that, you know, the institutions are functioning properly according to, you know, agency require, excuse me, uh, agency, you know, uh, uh, requirements. Uh, and I think those are, those agencies are really, uh, are really successful. Um, uh, and I also think the agencies that, uh, that when needed uh, are prompt in uh, reviews of institutions that that are having problems. I mean, the the issues don't linger, or the agencies are really on top of things when, say, there may be something in the news about an institution. Uh, you know, they don't they don't wait uh, before they go in and conduct a review. You know, I used to, I would tell folks that for us, it's not whether, um, you know, the agency took some sort of immediate, immediate adverse action against the institution. We really want to see first, did they go in and take a look to understand what was going on and then evaluate the institution based on their uh, accreditation standards, their policies and procedures. And we find the ones that really have um, you know, that have the processes to do that uh, are, are some of the more successful accrediting organizations. Uh, so that's, that's, that's one of the, that's one of the things that, that, that I see, you know, for, for our uh, accrediting agencies across the board, you know, how do they monitor and then uh, how do they uh, intervene or review their institutions when things do occur? No, excellent. That is uh, very insightful. And it also is one of those things that I'm like, oh my goodness. So coming from an institutional background, I, you're like, oh, so in order for my accreditor to really be seen as an excellent accreditor, when things are not going well for us, the accreditor needs to get involved, right? And sometimes, you know, that's like the, the last thing you want right now is the accreditor, right? To also uh, the, uh, you know, adding to, you know, the turmoil or whatever it might be. But what you're saying is incredibly important. I mean, in order to keep the, um, really the standard of um, quality, that we're striving for in higher education accreditation and that your team is charged with leading um, from the department monitoring. I mean, we learn the best from, you know, things that don't go well frequently. Uh, I mean, it's an very insightful. Um, that is um, an incredible takeaway for our accreditor uh, partners to think about you know, how are you following up when things are not going well, as opposed to, you know, always giving the attaboy when things are, are going excellent for an institution or program. That's true. And then just, again, monitoring in general, you know, just, just having systems in place to, you know, to be able to, uh, you know, obtain information uh, from schools, uh, you know, to monitor Things like, you know, student achievement or finances or, uh, you know, complaints that students may be making at institutions. Just just good monitoring uh, practices and requirements, of the, whether it's, you know, whether it may be, you know, unannounced inspections through the annual reporting requirements if accrediting agencies choose to do those things. But those agencies that have those good practices in place, uh, uh, you know, usually you know, usually do very well with oversight of their, uh, you know, of their institutions. Excellent. And they're not shying away from difficult conversations, right? That's and, yeah. yeah, that's excellent. And it also um, is very interesting to think about um, what you're saying here as well. It's not always, it, you're not saying, you know, make sure that you're following up when something um, is not going well, that that's important, but just in general, the, the days of I'll see you in 10 years are over. Right. right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's just more of a of a continuous review, if you might. I mean, you know, maybe to use that term, but it's it's just it's just continually understanding, uh, you know, what's maybe going on in an institution and 
I know some people are, are saying now, well, wow, you know, some of these agencies are credit, you know, you know, five, 600 institutions. And I said, I, look, I, I truly understand that, you know, but, uh, and, you know, you're not going to maybe catch everything at the spur of the moment when it happens. But what we look at is, okay, when you do find out, what do you do? You know, do you, do you immediately go down and try to figure out what the situation was and, uh, and then if necessary, you know, take the appropriate actions. Excellent. Um, so let's talk about this just a little bit. Where do you see accreditation evolving next? You know, I just kind of alluded to, you know, the days of 10 years and see you later, uh, you know, are gone. You know, where are we headed uh, down the road here from your perspective? Yeah, that's 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 another good question. I don't really know if I have a, a good answer for that. I, I can just say that. Uh, you know, there there is renewed concern regarding maybe student achievement. I think, I think, um, of course, that's that's always been a discussion in the past. But I think there's even more scrutiny on student achievement. Um, uh, what does it look like? What should it be? What should be measured? You know, benchmarks. You know qualitative, quantitative measures, combinations of both. Uh, I think, you know, that's going to really be a, a, a bigger, a larger focus in the future. Uh, it's, it's a large focus now, but I think, uh, you know, that's going to continue uh, to be of concern for folks, you know, at the department, for other interest groups. I just think it's I just think it's something that we as educators, no matter what role we're in, are going to have to try to tackle and figure out, you know, what's best or, or what's appropriate uh, in different situations. And and the diversity in our, as you know, the diversity in our uh, educational community and programs, I mean, it's, it's like through the roof, you know. So trying to you know, find student achievement standards that are appropriate for everything. It's really going to be, it's really going to be a challenge, I think. Yeah, there's so much, you know, again, the it depends answer. There's so much that those numbers and metrics uh, depend on, you know, it's very different um, in one uh, institutional and educational setting to uh, look at student success and define it than it is to say, you know, when you're looking at, uh, a very different kind of program and a very different setting, different student populations, you know, what is success? I mean, the, all of that is so very difficult. We've, we've been struggling with it for um, many, many years uh, at um, the institutional level and it's trying to standardize it right across all these institutions. You and I have uh, spoken about that before is, you know, how do you pick a metric and say, this is the benchmark for everybody? you know, which is what some of the calls are for, it feels like. Yeah, it's it's really tough. And then, you know, you just mentioned it, uh, you know, what is what is success for an individual student? I mean, what 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 is their goal and outcome? And sometimes our our uh, regulations now maybe don't, you know, don't capture that. I mean, at, at our school, uh, when I was back in Oklahoma, you know, we would have students that just wanted to come in and take a different portion of a program and they were perfectly happy with not completing that particular program because they got the particular, and I'm talking career and technical education, a little different, but they got the, uh, they got the, uh, the uh, skill that they needed uh, from that particular program and they didn't need to complete. But of course, as you know, that then goes against the school's completion rate. If that's one of the, one of the things that the school measures. So, you know, I think we have to look at some of those types of things uh, too, when we're talking about, you know, overall uh, student success. And then there's, there's a lot of discussion now about what happens to a student after they graduate, you know, was, you know, did the educational program that they completed, you know, was it beneficial for them after they graduated, you know? And so I think there's just so many different, uh, things to consider, uh, you know, you know, in the space of student achievement, um, it's, it's really going to be a challenge to, you know, try to figure out 
uh, you know, you know, what's appropriate there. Excellent. And, and you and I, um, you know, I think, think a lot alike on the idea of, you know, what a student um, and their success metric is when they're 20 years old and even 10 years down the road may be very different, right? And so what happens to you immediately upon graduation when a student is easiest to find <laughs> and most likely to respond, um, and still we struggle with getting them to respond for whatever reason, uh, and then thinking about that, you know, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, what did success really look like for you now that you're a mature adult with a career, uh, it's so very different. Um, it's it's something that uh, it's worth struggling with, for sure. It is definitely worth struggling with, but it is a struggle. It's a struggle for all of us in um, education in general, I think, but also in higher education as we start to think about more standardized metrics and holding folks accountable for student achievement and what does that look like and publishing it. And now um, what you're talking about, um, where we're saying, you know, potentially embedding it further and further, more prescriptively, um, if you will, into accreditation standards and requirements. Um, you know, I, I hope that we uh, move forward on that type of thinking very, very carefully. I know a lot of really smart folks are thinking about it for us, but I think um, being cautious there is um, something that we would all appreciate um, on the other side. Yeah, I think so. I often say it's going to take putting... Uh... A, a, a lot of very smart people in the conversation, you know, the, to try to uh, tackle that problem. I think, you know, student achievement to me is like, you know, leadership. No one has the key, <laughs> you know, what is yeah. what is right and what is wrong. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I, I hope I'm privileged to be, you know, in some of those conversations, but you know, I think at some point those things are going to have to happen if we want to uh, somehow, you know, figure out what's best for students and, and, and how to evaluate, uh, you know, how to evaluate them and, and, and how well they, you know, they're, they're doing. And, you know, it's just a tough subject. Yep. Measure what you treasure. So at some point we have to measure it, even yeah. if it's hard to figure out. Uh, excellent. Uh, so Herman, it's been wonderful to speak with you today. Um, I always like to ask folks um, what they're reading. Um, <laughs> if you're reading anything that uh, you would recommend uh, to our listeners, uh, we have a lot of readers out there um, coming from education. Yeah, you know, that's funny. I, I spent so much time reading petitions for recognition. <laughs> it's really, we, you know, there is a, now this is an old book that I, uh, that I refer back to a lot. And it's not so much related to education, but it's more of a strategic planning uh, book that I have read in the past and that I go back to. And it's, it's really, it's called Winning in Fast Time. And it's by uh, uh, a guy by the name of uh, John Warden, and uh, the unique the unique excuse me <clears throat> the unique thing about the particular uh, this book is that when it talks about strategic planning, it it tries to get you to look at what is the future picture of your organization, and then you kind of plan backwards from that. Meaning, if if you say you want to be a world class um, you know, you know, car repair center, whatever it's one, whatever, whatever that is. So now you have to plan. What are the things that you need to do to accomplish that? You know, do you want do you want to have well trained folks? Do you want to have good customer service? So you start planning those things to get to whatever that future picture is. So I think it's an interesting book. I mean, I think it was written probably 2011, 2000 you know, 10 or sometimes, sometimes like that. I may have the dates wrong, but, you know, I find Excellent. it, be, I find it to be interesting. Uh, so. Uh, Excellent. I love that. And it's one of those things too, when you think about strategic planning and uh, accreditation standards or even recognition standards right. uh, in a lot of ways, I mean, this is a, uh, a strategic plan 
for how to run an excellent accreditation organization. These are, in a lot of ways, standards that are their best practices that have been identified by wise folks in the field. This is what an excellent program, an excellent institution looks like. This is what they do. Uh, it doesn't tell you necessarily how to do it, but it right. does give you a lot of that. So thank you for that recommendation. I'll be sure to make sure and uh, follow up. And I haven't, I've read a lot of things, but I haven't read that one in particular. So I'll look forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if somebody wanted to continue the conversation with you, how should they get in touch? Well, uh, you, you know, you can go to, um, <clears throat> first of all, you can just contact me at, uh, at Herman Bounds, you know, herman.bounds at ed.gov. You know, there, that's my email address. Uh, and I, I usually, I usually try to answer that, uh, as often as I can. Uh, so that's probably, you know, that's probably the best way. Uh, and then I think my, my uh, and people are probably going to say, you, you gave out your office number, but <laughs> you know, that's, I'm, I mean, it really doesn't bother me. I make, I think my, my, my desk number is, uh, is, you know, area code is 202-453-6128. So, you know, questions, you know, feel free to, feel free to call. I'm always happy to, you know, try to pick up and uh, answer questions when I can. But the email is, is really, uh, is really a good way to, to get in touch with me. Excellent. Thank you so much, Herman. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today, and I look forward to our next conversation. Well, thank you. And again, I am, I'm very happy to be here and, uh, uh, you know, this is this has just been a good, a great opportunity for me. Excellent. Well, I enjoyed speaking with Herman today uh, and learning more about the role of the Department of Education uh, and how they approach recognition of accreditors. Uh, I also have spent many years hearing about the uh, committee Nisiki. Uh, and their uh, role in accreditation recognition as well. I thought it was especially interesting to hear about the interplay between uh, what's happening internally in the review process at the Department of Education, along with the recommendations of the Nisiki organization, and the, that both of those are uh, going to uh, the senior director to uh, make a final decision. I don't think I really understood that previously. So that was uh, fascinating to learn a little bit more about the inner workings of that process. Uh, this was one of our episodes that was more focused towards the accreditor as well. Um, you know, it's interesting coming from an institution, uh, learning about the um, bigger picture of accreditation. But for our accreditation organization listeners, uh, I hope you were able to take away some things that will assist you in thinking about uh, what makes an excellent accreditation organization, what kind of uh, processes, uh, and thinking about how you prepare to be ready for your recognition with the Department of Education uh, if you are uh, getting ready to pursue that. Um, I will look forward to our next episode. Uh, we have some wonderful things coming for fall uh, that are uh, going to really be a wonderful learning opportunity for all of us. Uh, so keep listening. Uh, please subscribe. Um, you can subscribe using uh, any podcast uh, platform that you uh, use, uh, as well as YouTube. Uh, you can subscribe uh, using the little YouTube subscribe button. Uh, and I encourage you to do so so that you will be alerted the next time we have an episode released. Um, you can also subscribe to our uh, Leave Connections communication, and um, that is via email. You can go to our website, weaveeducation.com and uh, ask to be added to the subscription list. And you will uh, then also receive notification in your email when we have new episodes come out. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.